Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Peter Huynh and I'm the manager for field marketing uh, in APAC at GitLab. Today we're presenting on DevSecOps, the what, the why and the how by SAMA, Senior Solutions Architect at GitLab. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being recorded. The presentation and slides will be emailed to you after the webinar has finished. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to uh, type your questions in the uh, question box in your Zoom control panel. Um, and I'll bring them up during the meeting, or sorry, during the presentation. Um, and we'll also have some time towards the end of the webinar for questions. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's uh, presenter. Samer Akab is a certified cloud architect equipped with over 20 years of experience in transforming business needs into workable technology solutions. Samer has worked uh, for many large uh, organizations across the Asia Pacific region, uh, helping to establish their cloud native practices, um, setting up efficient development life cycles and align, aligning their IT plans to the expected business outcomes. Over to you, Samer. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pete. Thank you, uh, Tim. And uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Yeah, as, as Pete said, uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Samer Akub. I'm a solution, currently a, a solution, customer solution architect working for uh, GitLab. Uh, before GitLab, I have been working in the industry for almost 20 years. Uh, I went through multiple different positions uh, as advisory architect with Pivotal, which is now VMware, as you all know, uh, as a cloud domain architect with NAB and a cloud lead architect with Oracle and many other uh, positions. Uh, so, so this is, you know, this is the agenda for, for today. We will start with what is the DevSecOps? We will try to dig a little bit deeper on the differences between DevOps and DevSecOps. Why do we need uh, DevSecOps? Uh, what are the different ways of implementing DevSecOps based on what we have or what we have uh, uh, been uh, exposed to from working with customers worldwide in, in GitLab? So, just to go back to the basics where that DevOps started from, from. And you know what? I'm sure that most of you today would agree with me that it all started from the try to compress the cycle time, which makes really the difference between winner and loser. Who reach or access the customer first? Who present the product first to the, uh, in the market? Who can expose to new markets faster? Also, the, how fast can I detect that my strategy, business slash IT strategy is working efficiently before making big investments in my, in my environment? So that, cutting that cycle time brought to the table the need for having an automated dev, DevOps. So in my try to define dev, DevOps, uh, I did that, uh, what most of people would do, logically, went to Google, what's, what's DevOps? And you know what? I got 66 million, uh, 300,000 results. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the guys that through the 66 million, 300,000 results to, like, to define DevOps. I'm just kidding. I can't see your faces, but I hope you're smiling there. So, so um, um, just the most common, uh, let's say, attributes, in most of the DevOps definitions are between the collaboration, tools, culture, and processes to be able to deliver the value fast to the customers or to the end users or to deliver my products fast to the market, right? So let's remember this. Having a very quick cycle, delivery cycle, using collaboration, so DevOps is not only tools, Many people would maybe refer to DevOps as DevOps tool, not it's collaboration, it's processes and, and, and cultures and tools, all working together, right? So, cool. Most of the organizations today have successfully implemented fast DevOps cycle. I would say maybe efficient DevOps cycle to deliver va uh, 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 value to their customers uh, fast, but, if we look at the popular cloud vulnerabilities today, most of them are coming from these client applications or, or as known as misconfigurations or uh, vulnerability applications. So these are coming not 
only in modern applications, but also from legacy applications. But things have become even more difficult to control with the new applications. In other words, if you look today on microservices, it's all about APIs and APIs exposure. So more surface of exposure for, for hackers. More like the security tools used today, and maybe you agree with me, most of them have been developed 10 plus years ago, at least. And we are bringing a modern development strategy or cycle. We're trying to marry that with security tools to achieve a secure delivery, right? The integration in our development cycle is usually coming late or uh, like towards the end of the delivery process. So to make it to make today's session a bit interactive, let me start with this uh, question, poll question, and please, uh, Pete and, and Tim, help me gathering the results here. Has the focus, and this is please on the screens in front of you, just give me your idea. Has the focus on security and development changed over the, law, the past three months? Please feel free to give me the, like, has increased, yes, 84% coming, results coming. I'll give it 30 seconds before ending the poll. 62, 65, I'm looking for 90% reply. Okay, I'll give it another 30 seconds. I'm just, uh, right, okay. 71% of you guys said it has changed or it has increased even. And 40% remained the same. And you know what? This is very, very comparable to what I see uh, with the customers I'm working with. And I absolutely don't blame, or uh, I, I can't understand why this development uh, security changed. Because you know what? Regardless of the industry you are working on, you're working in modern electrical cars, you're working in financial sector, and even you're working in like government or tech operators, nobody is safe. And, and, the attacks are coming regardless you are working on-prem or in the cloud. There is a myth here, and let's, let's agree on, like, just try to work, to work this out. I'm working on the cloud, then I am safe because the cloud provider is taking care of my security. This is a myth. This is not, absolutely not true. Actually, most of the time, if you are working on the cloud, you are more exposed to attack tax than less exposed. And the first thing you sign on when you work with or you move to the cloud is security is your responsibility, Mr. Customer. Definitely on the application and, config on, and configurations level. Yes, the tools are there, but it's your responsibility to manage that overall security and it's absolutely your responsibility to scan and make sure your code is, is secured. So, thanks to Pirates of the Caribbean, there will be almost, trust me, there will be always more of them than there are a few. There are more attackers than number of people you hire in your organization to do like security controls and, and, and uh, 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 auditing and review. So the idea here, and this is what I want all of us to agree on, hopefully by the end of the session, is we want to come to, come to a point where security is a, a behavior. It is an, an integrated part in our, in our DNA, in our development DNA. So what's the reaction for that exposure? Let's solve for obvious, obvious cases. And the obvious case is, and this is like, you know, this is a typical security or development life cycle. I'm a developer. I send my code to a repository. From there, it goes through a, a continuous integration cycle, then continuous delivery and deploy to test staging environment, maybe production. And then I have these giant engines of security uh, auditing 
and review uh, 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 practices. So I pass my code through these engines and I sit there waiting for the feedback on my tools, on my, on my developed application. Trust me, if for, from what I hear in the market, that waiting period goes anywhere from two hours to two weeks waiting for that review to come back because nobody wants to be shown on the news next day as our friends in, in the previous slide. So definitely people are doing their job perfectly and they are doing it to the, to the maximum where every line of code needs to be reviewed and every change needs to be reviewed. But guess what? The business is sitting there waiting for that new capability to be released to the market the developer is sitting there, he, they've already started working on the next cycle, then the next cycle, then the next cycle, and maybe in a couple of days to a week, they will get back, and sometimes maybe even more, they will get back the results. And then the developer needs to go back and remember what he has changed on that day, on that change, on that push request, and tr try to fix it. So, so basically, What's happening there, many times, we feel that security is a square pig in a round hole. Because we are trying to integrate something very important, nobody denies that it is important, very vital, in, uh, like, but it has been developed outside, like the DevOps idea of having continuous delivery. We are trying to integrate that in our tools or in our DevOps life cycle. You see my point? The point is, is not really in the, like there is nothing wrong with the security. Absolutely, this is a very required building block. But what's happening here is, instead of having a secure DevSecOps, we end up with DevOps plus security. And there is a big difference between the two. Nobody wants to pay. Put it a different way. Nobody likes to pay taxes, right? But having tool or security as an extra thing in the in the tool chain, we end up paying the tool chain tax. We end up having more integration points, more tools on the table. We need to more to train more users. And remember, the users you are talking about here are the developers most of the time, not the security architects. You need to switch between contexts because yes, that like the development is happening here, but remember the security tools are, are already established in the organization here. And there is like there is an integration, there is a gap between the two, which most of the time the security vendor will give you maybe some plugins to integrate with your DevOps to make it as it looks like as if it is seamless, but they are still two two different tools, right? And you need, of course, you need to administrate the, these, these uh, different tools. Can I ba go back to the polling and get your, uh, uh, look, I will bother you maybe another more time. So this will be a very interactive uh, session, hopefully. So how often does the security fully review the code before it is sent to production? Like on every code change in every branch, on every code change in the master branch, and please, please give me, I'm not recording who's, who's answering what, so please give me your, uh, based on your experience. On the code, once it is ready for production and post-production. Okay, another, I'll give it another, another 30 seconds. Okay, 67%, come on, it's one day. Like, yeah, done, 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 done. Usually I play music in the background, but um, no, if you don't want me to sing, definitely, yeah. Nobody wants me to sing. Excellent, thank you very much. 46%, which is expected. It is on the code once it is ready for production. This is a very, thank you, I really appreciate this. This is a very, very realistic 
uh, 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 results. Because I'll tell you something. The point is running security itself, running this security engine is an expensive financially and effort and time wise from all aspects. It is an expensive practice. Is it required? Absolutely, yes. But it is an expensive practice. But you know what? Based on the NIST uh, survey, it cost almost 30 times more to fix something if it is uh, 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 in the production, if it is discovered in the production, uh, compared if it is discovered in the early stages of the development. Imagine, like, okay, you can see the picture. So let me here just rehearse a little bit. We understand the value of the security. Uh, sorry, the value of the DevOps. Tick, yes. We understand why it is important. Tick, yes. We understand that by having DevOps means you are being exposed more to the attacks. Yes, and uh, like there are so many market, uh, I mean, uh, uh, news and articles on uh, companies who have been exposed. So definitely, yes. So we understand the value of having security in the cycle and integrated, but that like the challenges of having that, yes. The problem is now having another security engine means I am checking the box of having of, of secure code, but I am unchecking the box of the key of the key purpose we set up the DevOps practice, which is a quick delivery. Do you remember that 66 billion results? All of them agree on having quick delivery of value to the customers. So we are sort of unchecking that by adding another milestone, another bottleneck, another gateway in my, in, in my code release, release cycle. So now it costs 30 times more. What happens when you find 10,000 vulnerabilities at the end of the software development life cycle? And trust me, 10,000 is not an exaggerated number. It's like, and people who have been working in big enterprises, I have seen this number. They know that this number is like, can be seen. So you now need to go back to the early stages and fix these 10,000 up, let's say up to 10,000 different vulnerabilities and let your developers work on them. Good luck convincing the, the management that you need, you need extra time. So the point is, what if, you dealt with each one of them at the time where it was introduced. Oh, yeah, sorry, I'll take it back, sorry. Yeah. So remember, what if, I, what if you dealt with each one of them at the time where it was introduced? Which means I'm a developer, I'm putting this piece of code, I'm able to run the scanning now, not one type of scan, right? I'm talking, I will, we will come to that but I'm talking here about fully being able to know in my branch, in my changes, that things are secured, being able to fix them immediately before they are moving or merged into the master, master branch. You know what that means? It means that your master branch is always deployable to the production. And, and you're, you're, you are able to deliver almost at the speed of the business requirements. So most important security product won't be a security product. I should have a poll question here to, to see you if you think, uh, if, you, if you agree with me, but I would assume yes, because this is from uh, uh, someone who's, who's deep into security and, and VMware. And the point is what he means that it's, a, it's all about practice. It's all about having real dev set ops not DevOps plus security. And, and we, we, I think now it's clear what's the difference between the two. I promise last one. <laughs> Does accelerating development and delivery mean that you have to sacrifice quality or security? Do you agree with me? Yes, no, and uh, yeah, Peter or, or Tim, can you bring up please the polling? Yeah, thank you.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we are almost there. Forty six percent. Mm -hmm. 48, 33, 77, 78. There are still 10 more guys who didn't vote. Dun, 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 dun. So, and here we go. It's almost a tie between no and it depends. And I totally agree with this result. I'll tell you something. Usually, when this DevOps cycle is happening and, <clears throat> and you are sending more and more changes to the security department, especially in big enterprise uh, organizations. You are talking here about things that start to be accumulated, to start to be uh, accumulated at the security side. And here the business slash security, they have two options. Either, or actually three options. Either, which the business usually they don't take, either they hire far more people to be able to cover that cycle, but guess what? The more people you hire, the more releases coming, the more people you hire, so that will not happen, especially in this room, like in what's happening today in the market. Second, the security, they have to lower their expectations or standards so that the code can be released to the production faster. I mean, I mean, they may say, okay, things under low to medium criticality, it's okay, I'll accept that for now. Or classes that haven't been exposed much in the last two years, it's okay, I'll, I know there are vulnerabilities there, but I'll accept them because I don't have time to go back to the development team and make them choose or use different classes. Or the third option, the business have to lower, the business, sorry, has to lower their expectations by accepting that the code will not be delivered in a week and they need another two weeks to be able to release the code secure it in the market. You see my point? So just to hear, either you hire more people, which trust me, it will not happen, or you hire uh, or you lower you lower your security standards, which is, I would, I would accept a bit, a bit, I would be more relaxed. Working with security teams in, in previously, they, tend, they don't tend to lower their standards. Trust me, they enjoy the, the, that power. Or the business have to accept uh, the lower uh, 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 standards, lower expectations from the release. So, what if we can scan the code every time? Remember you told me before that most of the scanning is happening just before we go to the production. So, what we want to do today, what if we can scan the code every time? What if we can bring that even to the development? What if we need, we can use fewer tools and have DevSecOps, developing security and operations on the same page, not have DevOps practice and security. And of course, make the uh, auditors happy, which usually it's not an easy task. I, I, most of the time, I'm sorry for people who have iPhone, most of the time I have Android phone, right? I used to have a DSLR right camera watch i invested like good amount of money in it and when we when we go we used to go out uh before used to right before the this COVID thing uh if you still remember we used to go out in cars seeing places taking photos that's in in the past world i used to have two tools with me big one and the other mobile each having their own doing their own business and now then trying to integrate the output from the DSLR and the input of my mobile and sharing my sharing these photos and images with friends until to a point where my integrated tool, my integrated platform, which is this one, is able to provide me with an end-to-end -end solution from 
communication, from texting, from taking good quality pictures and share them with, the, with, the, with, the, with my friends. You know what I did? I sold my DSLR and I lost a good amount of money. Because I feel that the value this integrated platform is bringing me to the table is far more than having an extra 10,000K whatever resolution in that camp. Now, in normal, in normal DeepSecOps, you don't have, you don't have to ditch your current security engines, which are built for purpose. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that this DevOps community, they need to have security as an integrated practice. It is an integrated part in their daily life. Trust me, simplicity and integration always wins. You want to pass that through that engine at the end, it's fine. But instead of having 10,000 vulnerabilities there, we'll end up with so much fewer number of vulnerabilities which can be fixed easily by the developers and a lot who have, who have been doing the, the, the development. And by time, this tool will learn from the outputs from there and most of the, you will end up having a st completely streamed output to the production. And this is what GitLab, uh, has been uh, helping customers around the world to do. Shifting security lift and making it within where it fits most, within the DevOps uh, practice, as an integrated practice inside the DevSecOps. As you see here, we in GitLab provide the security capability to run on the feature branch not only on the master branch. I'm not saying that you can run it on the master branch. And by doing that, I am a developer. I create a merge request. I do my changes in my, in my branch, right? This is important. And you are doing the security as close as possible to my changes. Basically as close as possible, I mean once I push or commit my code to that feature branch. The, the review will happen there. The changes, I will be able to see the changes, or sorry, the outputs or the results from that review immediately there. In the same, within the same minutes where I did my changes. And I will be able to fix that there. Not, so instead of having, as you, as you said in the previous poll, instead of having most of my scans all the way closer to the production where it is 30 times more expensive to have to fix the results, uh, the findings, I'll bring them all the way to the developer side. And by doing that, in the GitLab, we provide, and actually recently we even added one more, we provide container scanning on the developer next to the, as a, as, as a tool. We provide static application security st scanning. We provide dependency scanning. We provide license compliance scanning. And we even go ahead and provide dynamic application security scanning, uh, 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 sorry, testing. Each one of these in the security world means a totally separate engine that I need to integrate with. In GitLab, if they are all coming and become part of the cost of the developer tool chain, daily tool chain of the developer uh, uh, keys to the development kingdom, right? And even recently, it has been just, just been released yesterday, we have added the fuzz testing. So what does that mean? It means that I have a continuously, uh, a continuous integrated real dev SecOps right? From, I do the development, the new commits coming into, in, into the Git repo, the scanning and analyzing is happening there on my branch. I can see the outputs and I can mitigate the findings. I can protect them, I'll, I'll come there. I can protect them once they are deployed to the production and then that development lifecycle continue. So, do, do, if, do you want to have, once it is deployed to the production, let me go one, one actually two steps. Do you want to have another tool for, for in your existing environment for extra scanning here before you go to the production? Please 
be my guest and do that. But the point is, we need to hear, we need it to be clear. It's about having security integrated in the DevOps cycle to make it a real Dev, DevSecOps uh, 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 or uh, cycle. So you did the SaaS scanning, oh, sorry, you did the security scanning. On the other side, by the way, here it says on our roadmap, it's already on our production. It has just been released yesterday, the fastest. So this is from pre-release. Once it is released, we have SecOps visibility. We enable our customers to deploy web applications, firewall, container networking security, and even container on the, our roadmap, container host uh, security. So you can define your security policies and let GitLab deploy them to your environment, especially if you are working on in a Kubernetes environment. So GitLab, and this is, this is many people know GitLab as the uh, source code management or source code automation platform. GitLab means it's meant to have an end-to-end -end DevSecOps platform that starts from creating an idea or what we call it, an issue or a ticket, whatever you want to name it, all the way through the agile project management capabilities, including the development, having security integrated. And this is what I was, was trying to explain here and then deploy that to the, to the production. So for people who like graphics, this is a real screenshot of a pipeline developed in, uh, uh, in, in GitLab. And as you can see, the security capabilities are integrated between on the, on the branch level with the security findings available for the developer to, to like to see them or to check on them. And I can choose by default, GitLab will auto, can even automatically, what we call auto DevOps, can even automatically integrate for you all the required scanning based on the code you are developing or the platform you are, you are using for the development and do then the review and test. But let me stop here for a second and just highlight on the DAST thing, the dynamic. People who have used dynamic application security testing before, they know that it has special requirements than all other development tools. And that's why usually this step is done on the production code because it requires a running version of my application. And most of the time, the license from whatever tool you are using is based on number of license of scans you do. And number of scans, I mean, one page can have 10 links. This is, these are 10 licenses count inside that page. In GitLab, this is all under one GitLab platform. And the solution is able, or the platform is able, to provision for you a live instance of your application and then pass that output of that instance, sorry, a live instance of your application based on the changes you did in the branch. So this is important, agents. Uh, I am, again, remember, this is all a branch. I'm doing my changes on that branch. I've changed the color from orange, the background color from orange to green. I want to see how green looks. I don't want to in, uh, uh, integrate back into the master because in the master, still the program should show background as orange. I did my changes here. The application will be able to deploy a live code of my green newly changed background into a testing environment. And if it is working, if you are deploying against Kubernetes into a different namespace even, automatically provisioned, run the DAS solution, the dynamic testing there, and, and even the fuzz testing there, and then giving you the outputs. This is very important. So this is the, here, if you see here in the right and the left side, this is the cycle I've been describing. Code commit, code changes, the developer is doing like, uh, 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 is getting the outputs from the security scanning, the DAS is working, there is a review sample app and then deployment. These people here, the security team, 
with all my respect for the people on the call, but these people are most of the time not absolutely not easy to satisfy. And they are most of the time suspicious of whatever is happening here. Their job actually is to be suspicious and their job is, is to be very careful on whatever the developers are, release, are releasing in this site. This is why in GitLab, we provide the security team with an end-to-end -end view of all the findings that are happening across all the developments on the project level, on the group of projects level, and even on the, on the whole program or enterprise level. Even if the developer dismissed one finding here, the security team will be able to find that dismissed right, uh, finding. So if I go back to slide number two, you remember in that 66 million finding, we agree that DevOps is all about releasing quickly using processes, tools, and collaboration. And this is why in GitLab, the findings, users and the security architects, and sorry, developers and the security architects, are, and even within the development community, they can review and triage and commit and collaborate on these changes. Pair finding, actually down to the line of code. Not only that, I'll, they can also create, push that fun, vulnerability finding to the beginning and create an issue based on that to add it to the backlog and of the DevOps cycle so that it will be handled. Let me, let me here highlight a very important thing. You find, you get your code. You pass it to the development, uh, sorry, to the security. The security team have their findings. They pass the report back to the development. I have seen it many, many, many times. I'm sure maybe in your environment, that pass back is done through Google form or uh, uh, the Microsoft document. Then these findings either fixed, dismissed or lost in the cycle. Because remember, these are two different tools. And in GitLab, because it's one integrated cycle or platform, the findings can be uh, can be transferred back and, and changed or uh, changed into an issue and be added to the backlog at, as a ticket to be fixed. This is this is the view I promised the security architects to provide and security auditors an end-to-end -end view of all the findings that happen in my security in your development environments across 30, 60, and 90 days across all the projects and you can filter based on the confidence report type severity. I think I don't like, most of the security friends I know would be happy with that. Actually, this is a big, a big issue. What's happening where? It's not about the tool. Trust me, it's not about the tool. Most of the tools in the market are good. Most of them are excellent even. It's not about the tool. It's about the, what I'm scanning and how I'm using this, that's the scanning outputs. So at the end of my session, I don't want to take Longer, but just, just I would love to leave you with some lessons learned. Driving fast with, Dev with DevOps, and here driving, I mean it, driving like driving a car. Driving fast with DevOps means higher crash rates without proper security. Without proper seatbelt, it means higher engineers, right? So, so just remember that, God forbid, and nobody would have any accident, but that's, that's real life. It is dev sick ops, not DevOps plus security. And please remember that there is a difference between the two. Next time you sit in a meeting and people say, we have DevSecOps practice, try to dig a bit deeper and see what do they really mean. Do they really mean DevOps cycle where developers are releasing code and then that output is done uh, as securely or, or monitored in the, at the end of the security? Uh, sorry, at the end of the release cycle. Developers need to have security available as part of, of sorry, of their daily tools, daily dual tool chain. I'm providing the developer with a development environment, with deployment environment. I also need to provide them with security tools. The win in the security finding is as important, and I would say it's more, most of the time, it's more important than the what 
I'm scanning. Yes, the scanning result is important, but trust me, a very detailed scanning report, which by the way, we provide in, in GitLab, a very detailed scanning report can become sort of useless if it comes too late, or if it is becoming a bottleneck in the release in achieving the business objectives. So the when is as important as the what I am scanning. As a compliment, and thanks for your time today, this is a link, and uh, as, as uh, Peter said at the beginning, we will share the slides. This is a, a, a book on, uh, authored by a, a certified uh, security uh, uh, personnel in, in, in GitLab, and it's about 10 steps every CISO should take to secure NextGen. It's free uh, to download. And we will pass you the links after after the session. So please feel free to go through it. It has very valuable real life examples on uh, customers who have done DevSecOps in a successful and unsuccessful way, and uh, what to look for when you implement healthy DevSecOps. What do we mean by DevSecOps? I hope you found this uh, helpful. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions, Peter. Thanks, Sam. That was very insightful. We've got a, a number of questions. Um, so first off, uh, first questions: How do you deal with a situation when security guys are not well versed in language um, you know, in the language you are using? Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a great question. This is where it becomes the standardization becomes very very important and delivering report in a language that the security and the developers understand becomes important, very, very important. I'll give you an example to uh, the gentleman who, who asked. Um, assume you are doing uh, um, Java scanning, right? And you are doing uh, on, on uh, uh, SAS scanning or security scanning, right? Now, the security team may not understand the Java uh, 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 vocabulary, I would say. But they would understand that there is a high critical finding from your Java code based on a package that was used or, or based, based on a vulnerability that was reported publicly and here is the link. So this is the value of having a common shared platform between the security and the DevOps and the development team where each will have their own dedicated view on what's what's happening. I hope that answers your uh, the question. Great. Next question is: What about SRE? Is it getting integrated as part of dec, uh, DevSecOps? Please share your Excellent. thoughts. Excellent. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll tell you something. SRE is most of the time is all about having different roles and the development or uh, 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 in the release the release cycle between development operations and and fixes absolutely yes and the evidence for that is in gitlab we not only are doing the scanning continuously we are also providing and maybe i should have added that we are also providing recommendations on the findings to a point where, where you can apply auto fixes to the back end of, of that, uh, that uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, code. This is one thing. The other thing is we enable our customers to train the tool based on their findings and acceptable findings to have a, their own customized, I would say, life cycle for, for implementation. Yeah, please. Uh, there's just a comment from Mo. Um, he's he's uh, said the SRE depends on your organization size and shape. Not everyone is Google, and therefore not everyone should put uh, should go for the same model. Thanks for that comment. I can't agree more. I can't <laughs> agree more. I can't agree. This is uh, thank you very much. This is very realistic uh, input. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Uh, implementing SRE on on different look. I have worked with organizations who have two thousand developers and have worked with organizations with less, less than 20 developers. The, what you want to adopt from the SRE, it really depends on your requirements and, and you don't want to adopt the practice just for the practice. You want to see what's the value on having different roles. Yes. 
Great. Uh, next question: What would be the what would be good security tools um, to be part of DevOps, and is SAS and DAS mandatory? Okay, that's a that's a, a very nice question. What it would be a good security tool? Look, I can't really tell what in your organization would be a good security tool, but because it really depends on what kind of development you are doing. For example, if you are not using containers at all, then having container scanning doesn't make any sense, right? But SAS and DAS, let me make it a, a general comment. These are the most common, and by most, I mean 99.9% .9 of the organizations have them if you are doing any kind of development, right? Because you, the vulnerabilities in SAS, the, there are always vulnerabilities in SAS that you want to, you need to be aware of. And that's requirement, the need, sorry, the need for that was way back in, in time where we need, we used to have, um, um, low, you know, remember that only load testing tools only, or like, uh, uh, um, um, uh, what's that, hacking testing tools. So I would say, yes, if you are doing publicly available applications or web applications, then yes. If you are doing any kind of development, using development tools, I would say yes. But the overall answer, what, what are the security tools? It really depends on your environment of what you are doing. Yeah. Okay, next question. How do you integrate the outcomes from DevSecOps into the wider enterprise security picture in a way that makes sense? Perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. The direct answer, we provide, and actually we slash the security vendors, the key players in the market, they provide as well integration plugins with GitLab, right? Plus all the features I've talked about today and, and as described are available through well-defined REST APIs for, for, for integration, right? Third, webhooks are commonly, commonly used for integrating GitLab with external, external I mean, uh, entities. And, and please, whoever asked the question, please feel free to approach me directly. I'm happy to run you through a demo where we integrated uh, uh, GitLab with external, external entities. Last thing, in our GitLab integrations menu, you will find a very long list of a pre-built integration capabilities with external uh, applications. Maybe I would add one last one. On Google, if you, if, you, if you just Google GitLab security integration with external tools, I think the first or second link would be, will show you how to do like a pass the reports from GitLab to the security tools and vice versa. Great, we've got about uh, another five or six questions. Um, okay. So in general, we will fix most critical and high and sometimes medium security issues and then leave the lower security issues for the next release as part of backlogs. Um, mostly this is how we work. Is this best practice? Okay, I think, I think whoever asked knows the answer. <laughs> I think he, know, he knows the answer. Uh, is this a best practice? I can't say yes. It's, it's uh, no, uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, I, okay, okay, let me be fair here. It really depends on these findings and what are, what is, the, what acceptable means in your industry, right, whoever asked. So acceptable for financial is totally different than acceptable in retail, uh, than acceptable in uh, 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 like a normal homegrown website, right? So that's one thing. The other thing is, if you are moving these medium to low vulnerabilities to the next round, you are wearing the risk and cost of fixing them later. Remember, fixing them like later in the cycle means it would be more expensive to be fixed. Developers who develop them are not always there and they are not always, they don't always remember what they have changed. Third thing, you are taking a known risk to the production. So, I can't make judgments here on what people are doing. I can't say it's, this is bad, but to answer the question, is this the best, uh, like a best practice? I would say, I would say no, but further details are more than happy to set after the call if they are approached us and go through this cycle, these findings and help 
setting up best practices for that for the development. Great. Moving along to the next question. Um, I think DevSecOps needs to integrate with the rest of the stack as well because the stack integration is a major vulnerability. Um, if there is vulnerability in the BIOS and it can be inherited in the application layer, will any of the DevSecOps effort make a difference? Uh, I would thank whoever asked that question. Thank you very much. Because he highlighted a point maybe I should have also highlighted it during the call. The integration itself between DevOps and security is a vulnerability, is a vulnerability uh, 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 or attack point. So bringing security under the same tool means you are patching and maintaining less tools. Remember here, more tools, more integrations, more things to be patched and managed. Even the security tools themselves, they are tools by the end of the day. So what we are doing here, they are moving this capability inside the, like, the DevSecOps, right? It's still, it's your option to choose which, which tool to change or which security uh, scanning to run. But by the end of the day, no more, scan, no more integration required, which means this vulnerability and less, less attacks, attack service. Uh, no more individual patching and, and administration. It's just one tool and I'm sure that's always uh, up to date and integrated. Yes, please. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna wrap a couple of questions together. Um, the questions, do we, have a, do we have a free trial to explore these DevSecOps features? And then also, what are the tools um, available by default within GitLab? Okay, excellent. The first one is easy. Uh, GitLab.com, you can register for 30 days trial, and that uh, includes the ultimate, the highest. And, you, and from there, yes, you can uh, uh, start using and, and, and uh, uh, experiencing the GitLab security offering. By the way, GitLab works exactly the same on-prem I would say, okay, exactly the same with asterisk, okay, because there are some details which we need, we can go through after, but with it's the same source code between on-prem and the SaaS offering. So just go gitlab.com, you can register there and start your 30 days free, uh, uh, I mean, trial. Plus you can approach uh, us, Peter, Tim, or myself, and we are more than happy to help you set up trial of, of GitLab and, and go through your requirements and even help you uh, like piloting these, these changes and test it in your environment. Uh, the second part, what are the security features? Uh, let me wrap up with this. Uh, static application security testing, dynamic application security testing, compliance testing, license scanning, fuzz, uh, fuzz testing, and dependency scanning. And they are all available on, uh, if you go on gitlab.com uh, security, then uh, you can see all of them. Hope that answers both questions. Yeah, so there's a couple of follow-up questions um, related sure. to that. So does, does GitLab have a, an inbuilt security scan feature um, or does it depend on other tools like Fortify, AppScan for SAS and DAS? Um, and then also what are the security scans done as part of DevOps cycle? Excellent, excellent, thank you very much. So the first part, the second part of the first part is no, we are, we are not depending on uh, 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 these tools, but in, for the SAS scanning, and this is all documented on our SAS scanning uh, tool, we use open source tools to run most of our SAS scanning, not any open source tools. These open source tools, most of them are uh, uh, highlighted and mentioned and, and uh, to some certain extent, recommended by the standard organizations for uh, uh, security scanning and, 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 and vulnerability testing. And we maintain them and we provide the customer, keep the customer up to date with the, all the vulnerability vulnerabilities databases. So uh, this is for that one. What was the second part, sorry, Peter? I, uh, um, what are the security scans done as part of DevSecOps? Oh, sorry, uh, DevOps uh, cycle. Uh, maybe I've partially covered that. The security scans would would do the static scanning, the dynamic scanning, the, uh, the dependency scanning, the license scanning, the compliance and fast, fast testing scanning. Do you have to run all of them? No, it's your choice which which one which one to run. Can they be dynamically even using the tool integrated? Absolutely yes. 
You can start within half an hour, uh, sorry, within five minutes. You can build a new uh, Maven project and have all the security features running on, on your code. And uh, yeah, I hope that answers you the, the question. Okay, and what GitLab, um, or, or do we have GitLab plugins to connect to commercial security products such as um, IBM AppScan and Veracode? Okay, it's it's a case by case. We have a, a lot, my, I, I haven't worked on, to be honest, I haven't worked on the IBM tools. Okay, I'm happy to, if they, the gentleman who asked, if he can reach out, I'm happy to dig into that question and see the integration part. As I said before, I never, found it difficult to integrate with any security uh, uh, tool available at the customer side because we have all of them as, as integrated APIs. Uh, just let me a little bit go one step back to the previous question. So I answered for the tools for SaaS, for, the, for dependency scanning or other security scanning tools, we use for some of them, we use our own uh, security testing tools like GitLab own security testing tools, like for dependency scanning we use Gymnasium for fast testing, we use the new solutions we acquired in GitLab. So it's a, it's a mix between open source and GitLab solutions, but all of them are supported through one vendor and integrated through GitLab. Okay, and, and how does the remediation uh, recommendation look like in the UI? I wish I had uh, yesterday, maybe I removed that slide, but uh, it's basically, and especially for dependency scanning, it, it is in the same dialogue as this one, right? If there is a remediation, uh, I mean, a recommendation, it will show up here as a button or as a link, and you can apply that directly to the source code. Especially for now, mainly it's a bit supported for container and, and dependency scanning. For example, for container scanning, if there are patches or upgrades that need that can be done to uh, overcome or solve that vulnerability, the recommendation, the button will be here, and that can be like just click and apply that re recommended remediation to the to the backend solution. Okay, just a couple more. Um, so, is Kubernetes overkill when we're a team of five people and are only running two apps? Uh, look. Uh, before answering a disclaimer, I'm a Kubernetes certified administrator. So I am a bit biased with, with Kubernetes. It really depends on the, uh, your organization requirements. I won't measure the Kubernetes efficiency based on number of people necessarily. I have seen organization with like two or three people and still they have Kubernetes and it's adding big value. Uh, it really, uh, look, look, I can't really say it is an overkill, no. Uh, it's, I'm happy to have that discussion. Please, please approach us and I'm happy to have that uh, uh, like a, a, a casual discussion on uh, and to understand more of what you are trying to do. Uh, does Kubernetes make people life easier in certain extent? Yes. Does it complicate, if it is misused, does it complicate people, especially the developers life? Yes. How we can help in GitLab? Uh, I don't have the screenshot here, but GitLab is an integrated, uh, can integrate out of the box with Kubernetes cluster. And even you can use GitLab interface to create Kubernetes cluster in AWS and, 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 and Google and deploy your application directly to that cluster without, I know, without opening that black screen, which people may not really like. Great. Um, Any and then yeah, we've just had a few people ask about hands-on um, sessions and, and workshops. These are in development at the moment. We do have um, a number of training um, elements on our website. So you can go there and have a look at the, the videos on how to get set up. But we are, um, as I mentioned, we are looking to develop um, some hands-on labs or um, technical sessions to be able to work through these um, types of things. Um, we're looking to do that on a quarterly basis. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and then also, um, there was a, a question around a comparison in terms of our um, our um, offering. Um, so obviously the free and the, the, the additional tiers. Um, so we've got, I think it's a, a bit much to go through, um, but we do have a um, a page on our website in terms of the feature comparisons um, for all our tiers. 
So feel free to have a look at those. Um, and I'll add these links to the chat. So that's the feature comparison. And then we've got the training page as well. Um, great. So that's the last question. Thank you very much, um, Sama, for presenting. And thank you for everyone for joining in or, or tuning in. Um, hopefully that was uh, insightful and, and valuable to you. Uh, just a reminder that the slides or the presentation recording will be emailed to you um, within the next few days. Also, um, we're running our next webinar on September the 16th, which is around GitOps. Um, so we hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.